so thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, and uh, not repeat the uh, title of the talk. Bas uh, basically, uh, I think I have talked about chromosomal organization and uh, several times, and some of you in the audience must have heard about it. Today we'll be uh, considering basically the role of crowders on such organizations. So first I would like to begin by thanking the people who are involved in this work, the large number of people who uh, are there. So uh, basically I would like to focus, uh, bring your attention to uh, Pinaki and Amit, these two PhD students who has done uh, all of the theoretical work and computational work I'm going to present today. And uh, given the short time, if I cannot make uh, do justice to the topic, uh, you may be may like to look at these three uh, published articles uh, to have a better overview of what what is there. So uh, briefly, the qu question we are asking is: uh, chromosomes are strongly compacted uh, stuffs uh, made up with DNA and proteins. And uh, they make membraneless organelle within uh, eukaryotic cells, like uh, prokaryotic cells, like uh, bacteria. Uh, so they get into a small lump, which is called a nucleoid. Doesn't have a membrane to uh, stabilize that lump. And the questions we ask is uh, two questions: What are the roles of uh, cytosolic crowders? Apart from the chromosome, there is a crowding environment around it and the cellular confinement on such organization. So what are observed in experiments? Uh, there are three specific things we would focus on. Uh, morphology of the chromosome, chromosome positioning, and segregation. So what do we mean? So uh, first, these slides are showing you experimental results. Morphologically, if I look at this chromosome, which stays inside cylindrical bacterial cell. So there is a confinement, which is cylindrical confinement. Inside that, if you look at the chromosome, the chromosome has a helicoid shape. That's one. The second one is that if you let the cell grow in that growing phase without cell division, what you'll see is that the center of mass of the chromosome remains sort of the center of the cell, at the center of the cell. Although the cell length can become really, really large with respect to the uh, total expanded length of the chromosome. So here in this plot, you are seeing this expanded length of the chromosome, and this cell is really large. It still can sense the center of the cell, stays at the center roughly. And the second thing what happens is that as the cell grows, this is time, and also the, this shows the length of the cell. As the cell grows, the chromosome length increases and then saturates, which is plotted here. So this data points with error bars shows the uh, size of the nucleoid as the cell grows. It grows smoothly uh, and then saturates beyond the point. Second part is about segregation. Now if I allow the cell to grow, but doesn't the cell doesn't divide, but the cell now what I allow is that chromosome replicates. Chromosome makes another copy of itself. And then if you look at that other copy, so both of these copies slowly starts to segregate. And here also, again, you see this time, zero minute to 240 minutes. Uh, so around four hours. Over that time scale, what you see is that these chromosomes are segregating. And if you imagine a half line through this, so these are the different cells. So these boundaries are showing you the cell walls. Uh, what you see is that these two chromosomes are going to the sort of the imaginary uh, middle point uh, of these half cells, although there is no cell boundary inside. So somehow, and still you see that chromosomal length is this. They can sense each other via something and then they uh, segregate. So the qu question one is interested in, uh, for a specific bacteria called E. coli, is that nobody could figure out a dedicated uh, segregation machinery in E. coli. And in absence of such a machinery, how such a nice segregation is achieved in E. coli? That, that was the question. And we try to uh, respond to that question. So uh, to do that, we use a coarse-grained model for the chromosome. I told you the chromosome is made up of a DNA chain associated with proteins. 
and that gives local structures to the chain. So if I look at the DNA locally, then it has some folded structure and there could be proteins which are maintaining those structures. And then uh, as Shudipto has mentioned in his first talk that uh, you often see chromosomal loops on uh, top of these chains. And this is sort of a loop. And you can then use a bottle brush like poly polymeric model for the chromosome where you have a central chain associated with side loops or plectonyms, which could be like side branches. Or I, we can do further coarse graining, assuming that these side loops and which uh, there are reasons for as, such assumption is that these side loops gives rise to a effective thickening of the main chain. So instead of the full chromosomal model, what I use a effectively thickened uh, chain, which I uh, use as, which I model as a chromosome. And then we use a confinement. The, uh, the cells we are considering are cylindrical with symmetric, so we'll take cylindrical confinement. And the last part is this, the sec, uh, another topic that Shudipta covered is that uh, chromosomes DNA produce proteins. So DNA produce proteins and protein production happens around the DNA. So this is the last part we'll be using in uh, trying to understand the whole picture. So first, uh, these, these results, what, what we are doing is that we are doing numerical simulations with this chain model inside cylindrical uh, confinement. And we say that the chain is producing proteins around it. And then the cell grows. So if you let it do that, then what you see is that the chain stays at the center of the cell because production of protein is symmetric in two sides that generates a compression and that compression maintain, maintains the central position of the chain. And also that maintains this helicoid shape of the chain, even for the uh, longest uh, cylinders, longest cells. And this, this uh, extension of this chromosome that grows and saturates. And the saturation depends on uh, the total amount of density, instantaneous density we allow in the surrounding. So the proteins are being produced, which maintains the uh, cytosolic protein uh, at, in the, in the, around the chromosome. And that, you, this is a parameter which we use. So if you have higher density, of course, your chromosome will uh, saturate to a smaller size because you'll get more compaction. So you can imagine this to be a spring which is compressed by crowders on the two sides. And of course, one can do uh, better theory, can write down uh, Degens blob picture, use Degens blob picture to write down a free energy for the chromosome and then uh, a free volume theory for the rest of the space available and do a free energy extremization and get an ex uh, relationship for this size, which depends on the cytosolic crowder density, length of the, uh, length of the cell, and also the uh, chromosomal length. So, this we achieve, and then this next question one would like to ask is that what if I try to look at the uh, look at the relative organization of the chromosome and crowders? What happens? So I have only three minutes left. Uh, briefly, what I uh, want you to uh, take from this slide is that if you look at the local crowder density, uh, which here we are plotting with these red dots, and the local uh, monomer density of the chromosome at different slices along this length of the cylinder. So what, what you'll see that they are slightly off balance. They are slightly segregated with these two center of masses and then one rotates around the other. So that you can uh, characterize in terms of the tangent correlation. These two, uh, two correlation functions oscillate out of phase and another thing you see is that the probability density of the local uh, probability density of the crowders and the monomers, they also show this oscillation, but out of phase oscillations. That example I've shown using a single crowder size, then you may imagine that I may have different crowder size in the system. So if I reduce the crowder size to very, very small sizes, then the crowders will penetrate everywhere. It will not be able to uh, compress the chromosome. If I increase the crowder size, it will start to compress and then 
finally get completely segregated longitudinally. But even in the intermediate state, it gets segregated slightly in the longitudinal direction and also in the transverse radial direction. And that gives rise to this uh, oscillation in the tangent uh, correlation function. And finally, that also gives rise to this density modulation of the monomers of the chromosome with respect to the monomers of the, uh, with respect to the crowders. And you see, again see that these density modulations are out of phase. Here I would like to uh, bring your notice, uh, bring your attention to uh, a recent experimental result of uh, E. coli bacteria again, looking at chromosomes and ribosomes. These plots, if you look carefully, you can see this slight helicoid shape of these ribosomes and chromosomes. And what was measured from this experiment are the in, uh, fluorescence intensity coming from this ribosome and both and chromosome, which shows this out of phase oscillation. So we uh, believe that this segregation is happening. Uh, because of this just simple local repulsion between these two things. And then uh, chromosome segregation as the, uh, as the cell grows. I already mentioned about this. Uh, if you do the same kind of simulations, assuming that the uh, DNA produces proteins around it, they will get segregated nicely, like I showed in that experimental result. And how do you understand that? Of course, one can just write down a simple force balance, say that the dynamics of this gap between two chromosomes evolves due to the pressure generated because of new proteins are being produced here, and proteins are produced there. So these two, if they balance each other, I get this relationship of this X, which tells me that the space left, space in the left is to middle to the right should have this ratio one is to two is to one. Just I'll take one uh, one more minute if you allow. Just one minute. So one can do a dynamics as well. And in the dynamics, what you can see is that you can figure out what is the time scale required for that segregation. Uh, so if you assume that I have just I take a cell, I allow at certain instance I allow certain proteins to produce and increase the cell length and ask a question, how long does it take for these uh, chromosomes to segregate to the new positions? That time scale is given by the cell length. Or the other possibility could be that the cell is growing with the rate and the proteins are being produced with the rate. Then you get a segregation which grows as function of time. And if you plot them, you see that in this sec by this second mechanism, if there is a production of protein and growth of the cell, at very short time, this what theory I showed is a linear stability theory. At very short time, it shows a quadratic growth uh, of this separation between two chromosomes as a function of time. And this depends on the, the prefactor depends on the rate of production of protein or growth of the cell. So okay. basically active acceleration, active accelerated segregation can be achieved. So one question one may ask is that segregation was possible, I have shown, but can you achieve segregation within the time frame uh, of the lifetime of the cell? So cell, what we are showing is that if the cell changes the rate, it can. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.